We've all run into that player who, after every battle, wants to carve up the monsters to collect, you know, the teeth or the scales or horns or whatever they can to take back to town to find out if it's valuable either to make something with it or to sell it. Every random fungi or unusual plant or mineral becomes for this player a potential payday. And as a GM, you're often of two minds on this concept. First of all, uh, natural ingredients can often be components of spells and depending on their efficacy, they can be very valuable or they can be rare in and of themselves and hence valuable. And you know, you want your players to interact with your world as though it's real. But if your players have no ability or means to determine the value of natural items that they find, it can bog down into an endless discussion, you know, with different proficiency checks and questions and can take forever. And even then the player may just decide, well, I'm gonna try to carve this thing up and take it with me. And the thing is, if you have a player who one time sold a, you know, basilisk's gullet for great cash, so now they, they meet the Gorgon and they wanna, you know, sell its lungs or something, you know, the question is, well, is that where the gas really is from? Does it dissipate when they die? How can you get the lungs out of it? You know, it can just be an endless back and forth. You know, when you're tempted with a player like this as a GM to say, you know what, there's nothing valuable here or whatever. But I think actually there is a way that you can incorporate, you know, natural ingredients and items and things of value without bogging down your game. As I will demonstrate. Hello again, folks, KR King here, helping you homebrew your own D&D campaign. So historically, people of the world got most, if not all, of the ingredients for their medicinal or crafting items from natural components. And of course, you had poisons that were taken from plants or animals that could be applied to weapons or given to one's opponents. And when you add the, you know, mystical uh, aspects of these historical practices. You get situations like Shakespeare's Witches in Macbeth, Eye of Newt and Toe of Frog, Wool of Bat and Tongue of Dog. So this sort of folk magic assumed that, you know, the various parts of animals had some kind of inherent power that could be used to create spells or divine the future. You know, and many of the components for spells in D&D are drawn from this tradition. You know, whether it's a mundane item like the, the twig, or some plant, or something really exotic like the feather of a rare bird. Or it can be very expensive, like a gem of a very high value. So I like to keep the tradition of natural components and ingredients, but without turning every session of D&D or every, you know, encounter or post-encounter into an endless Q&A of trying to figure out what's valuable. So for me, the key concept to remember is if you have a world in which natural ingredients are an essential component, of magical spells, both divine and arcane, and creatures themselves have body parts that have magical powers, there will be some general knowledge about what sort of plants, animals, and minerals are valuable for these practices, or rare enough to be worth something in and of themselves, and then most importantly, those that don't have much value. And then of course you have specialized classes within the structure of D&D, you know, rangers, druids, uh, bards and rogues that may have specialized knowledge of natural ingredients uh, depending on their focus. So you might expect druids to have the widest range of knowledge about plant and animal ingredients. Perhaps rogues would have a detailed knowledge of various poisons that are out in the world. You know, while arcane spellcasters of any class might know which sort of natural ingredients can aid or serves as substitutes for components for spells. And then you have issues like a player's background that might give them some insight into natural ingredients, components that might aid in crafting. You know, if you're gonna use an artificer class, they might know what sort of natural oils out there are good for lubrication. So what you're doing by establishing this template of general accepted knowledge, and then a higher tier of detailed knowledge about natural ingredients and components is to try to minimize the need for players to be constantly making skill checks or simply carving everything up or grabbing every plant or mineral or whatever, taking it back to town to see if it's valuable. I would assume that most people know the value of a lion's tooth or a bear's pelt 
and know whether it's worthwhile to skin the animal and preserve the pelt or whatever and carry it around when they're on a mission to potentially get booty of much higher value. You know, and this sort of general or detailed knowledge should extend itself to knowledge about how to extract this ingredient safely and how to transport it safely. So a rogue might have an idea of the value of a giant spider's venom and possibly how to store it, but they might not have any idea of how to extract it or even where it is in the spider. So unless you have a druid or possibly a ranger or someone with a background where this makes sense, there's some risk involved in trying to extract the poison. But here again, most people would have a general knowledge that you have to know what you're doing to extract deadly poisons. Think of the blowfish in the real world. Only a few chefs know how to safely prepare it. So unless these characters have this specialized knowledge, they just know, don't try to do that. So once you've established that the humanoids that make up the character classes in your world have this two tiers of knowledge, the general sort of everyday knowledge and then the specialized one, next you decide as the GM which creatures, you know, component parts, which plants, which minerals have high values, which don't. You're the GM, it's your world, and unless it says so specifically or differently in the book, you decide that. So you may say that the lungs of a gorgon, if removed from it, don't retain any of the petrification gas. It just dissipates into the air. And this sort of gas cannot easily be collected from a living gorgon, say one that's restrained or something. But notice that I said easily collected from a living gorgon. Because the idea here is it does leave open the option that you might be able to collect a gorgon's petrification breath. Let's suppose the players, you know, meet a gorgon, uh, they all make their saves with a petrification breath, they kill it. Would they even know that the gorgon, you know, has this breath? I suppose you could make a knowledge check. It depends on their level and their experience. But if someone got petrified in the battle, oh, they know the effect. But, you know, depending on your players, whether petrified or not, it may not come up that someone says, hey, can we bottle that breath? And if it doesn't, you just leave it alone. Or the Gorgon's dead anyway, and depending on how you've set it up, they're not going to have the expertise to extract anything of value. But here's where it gets interesting. Suppose you have someone, an NPC wizard, that knows that a Gorgon's lungs, when dried out and crushed into a powder, make up the perfect component for something. Doesn't matter. It's a MacGuffin. Uh, the wizard wouldn't tell the players what this was anyway. You know, or the oils that the Gorgon uses to lubricate its armor are extremely useful, or the armor plates themselves. You know, whatever the case, the wizard does the same thing that rich and powerful people do whenever they have a, you know, dangerous and dirty task. They hire someone else to do it. So the wizard, or more likely one of her minions, approaches the players with a job offer, gives them a location of a Gorgon lair, says go to the Gorgon, kill the Gorgon, and gives them exact instructions about how to remove the lungs or the oil or the armor plate. Or if you want to make it more interesting, the players are instructed when they kill the Gorgon, don't touch it, just bring the entire carcass back to the wizard. Or for an even more deadly twist, bring back a living Gorgon. So of course you can make the price commensurate, first of all, with, you know, killing a Gorgon. Uh, the distance where the lair is, the difficulty of getting there, you know, and if they have to remove it on site, the difficulty of that, transporting the material, you know, a living Gorgon, for example. But, you know, you can add some stuff in in addition to just gold pieces. The wizard could argue, hey, I'm going to give you this lair. You can have whatever is inside the lair. I'm giving you a route. In fact, I'm giving you a secret entrance into the Gorgon's lair so that you can come from behind. And I'm giving you a potion that will knock out the Gorgon uh, when delivered at close range so that it can be transported safely alive. You know, and these are just general examples. You can scale this up and down. You can have different information. But you can see that if the wizard really wants these Gorgon lungs, she's potentially going to give up a lot to get them. And the thing I like about collecting a natural item or ingredient for an NPC is it opens up a storyline for the players in a believable way and also tells them something about the world and the machinations of the various powerful NPCs of the world and gives them a connection to them. Once they've done this task, the NPC may want them for other tasks. They could even become an ally. They could hear things through them. You know, again, this is the sort of thing you do jobs for people, you create connections, you create a network. You know, and the list of natural items that are either dangerous or difficult to collect are varied. You know, there's some obvious things, you know, suppose the eyes of a Medusa or the poison sack of a Grung. 
But you could also have, you know, a very rare fungus that only grows in a certain cave in the Underdark. And this fungus is highly coveted by spellcasters. So the fungus doesn't have to be an animated creature, although it certainly can be in the world of D&D, which opens up possibilities of, are they going to go collect something that's just minding its own business, you know, living its life? But even if it's just an ordinary plant, you know, it may be in a very inaccessible location. It's very difficult to get to. It may be very difficult to collect and transport. And it might have some, you know, defensive spore capability that makes it deadly to approach. But, you know, you can also have natural items that are coveted only because of their rarity. A certain plant or animal or a very rare mineral. Never underestimate the desire of rich and powerful people to have something that no one else has. You know, it doesn't have to be a task set for them by a rich person. The players may discover that a very rare bird lives in a swamp. Its tail feathers are highly coveted by collectors and may decide to go there themselves. You know, and they could come back and you could have an auction situation where they're competing for, you know, among rich people. And this could introduce the players to the greater world as collectors of rare antiquities. More missions follow. You know, the danger in this hypothetical is the swamp. You can warn the players, hey, this is a very dangerous place, but if it's a highly valuable feather, can they resist? You know, and then you can throw in a wrinkle here. There's a competing group of NPCs who are also heading to the swamp to find the feather. Uh, the players have to figure out, is there a shortcut through there? Maybe there's a guide that can take them and guide them through the swamp. And you can have a final confrontation with this group. And it doesn't just have to be for financial gain. You could have an ultra rare a uh, plant or animal that's living on the side of a mountain that's undergoing volcanic activity. It's the last, you know, sample plant or living pair, and the players have to go there to rescue it. So there's tons of great examples that I've used of natural ingredients of different, you know, body parts or animals or plants or minerals, uh, also in terms of their geographical location, how difficult it is, that I'm going to detail in a PDF that I'm putting together and then I'll introduce later. But I wanted to talk about one special example in this video. And that's where a creature or potentially NPC actively opposes the players from collecting this item for personal reasons. <laughs> the most obvious example is the egg. Whoever laid that egg has a very powerful interest in keeping it. Remember that T-Rex movie where one of the supporting characters just takes a few T-Rex eggs and puts them in his backpack? Not a fun thing to do. You know, so whatever the properties and usages of a dragon egg, which we'll, we'll assume there are some in a D&D setting, is it worth stealing one to have a dragon on your ass? You know, and you can be creative. Perhaps there's an ultra-rare fungus that has properties that are highly coveted by magic users, but it's a sacred plant to a group of mycodids. You know, the players may be the ones trying to steal it, or they may be protecting it, you know, allying themselves with the mycodids to protect it. You may collect a dragon egg and decide to deliver it back to the dragon, but you better make sure your story makes sense. All right, so that's just a general overview on using natural items in your world. As I said, I'm creating a PDF that I'll hopefully have out soon, uh, giving a whole list of the ones that I use. But you can, of course, look through the manual, see what you think, see what looks interesting to you in terms of the monsters, you know, what their component parts might be. Be creative and think of scenarios in which it makes sense for your players to look into this. And of course, if you like what you've seen, please subscribe to my channel. I'm always looking for more. Leave some comments. I always answer them. And of course, keep playing D&D, &D, my friends, and tell somebody else about it.